Hello and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi, and tonight we have another special episode with two guests from our recent trip to Scandinavia. First, we meet Father Froda Eikenes, who converted to the faith at the young age of 19 and then entered seminary a mere four years later. Welcome, Father. It's Thank great you to have you here on The Journey Home. It's great to meet you, and we consider it a great privilege to be here in Norway with you. The Journey Home program, every week I, uh, when I interview guests, Converts to the church, I begin by asking them to take a step backwards and kind of start us back and give us an idea of your early spiritual journey before you became Catholic. Okay, thank you. Mm-hmm. First of all, also, I would like to say thank you for being invited oh. to the program. It's, um, I've heard about the program uh, also before from um, uh, both Norwegian Catholics and also American Catholics that I know. So it's uh, uh, a well, privilege it's, to be it's here. It's great to have you on the program. Bob. Thank you. Um, well, I have to start with my childhood uh, mm-hmm. then. Um, I grew up in a little town uh, called Grimstad, which is on the south coast of Norway. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, quite a religious town uh, in the south area of southwestern area of Norway that we jokingly call the Norwegian Bible Belt, <laughs> uh, very much shaped by um, evangelical free churches, by... Um, the low church movements within the ch- Lutheran tradition, uh, and we could say also Puritanism. Uh, Catholicism was unknown very much uh-huh. in my uh, hometown. Um, um, there was one or two Catholics that were known in the in the um, city, in that little town there. Amongst them was uh, the um, editor of the local newspaper, he was a very cultured man, a philosopher also, a politician in the Conservative Party, uh, and we could really say a member of the cultural elite of that town. And that was, I suppose, a typical way that in that area of Norway we understood Catholicism, that it was something for the few and <laughs> something for those a little bit different than the rest, uh, in a way. Uh, I had no Catholic friends. I knew no Catholics at school, um, nothing. But I grew up with strong Christian sentiments, so the Christian faith has always been a part of my my life. Uh, My grandparents on my father's side particularly were very active in uh, uh, a Lutheran um, uh, free church that also had a congregation in this town. So many of my friends also in school uh, were active Christians, and I was sent to Sunday school uh, almost every week, as long as I can remember. I was a scout also, Mm -hmm. um, uh, which was also uh, under the uh, uh, guidance of one of those uh, churches there in this this town. How did I discover Catholicism? It's um, really no good explanation to it, except from (laughs) God's grace or being lucky or something like that. Let me ask you, when you were brought up Mm -hmm. without any contact with Catholicism, were you you taught an anti-Catholicism as a part of your upbringing? Um, Not not very much. There was skepticism to Catholicism, uh, as would be normal in such an environment. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I think that was much more the generation before me, Uh, where we were even... uh, the, the religious education in school, we, which we had, was Lutheran. Mm. And, but it wasn't so anti-Catholic as it had been a generation before, okay. where really prejudices against the Catholic Church were, were taught in Norwegian school. Mm. That had begun to change. But still, we, we were taught that uh, uh, Luther came and purified the Christian mm. church and religion with the light of the gospel, and that before the Reformation things were not as it should have been, and, and so on. And that, that is, of course, not entirely uh, wrong. No. Uh, there were needs for, for change and for reform, but it wasn't need for a schism. You know, that was the, uh, the thing which I le- then began to, to discover. So my journey started with um, investigating the tradition of the church, the sacraments, the history of the church, uh, the, the traditions... Um, I began to discover the church, you can say, and also that the church was not everywhere else in the world uh, the same as it was in my town. I began to discover that Christianity, as I had known it, wasn't really the normal 
uh, original thing. It wasn't a representative thing for the rest of the uh, of, of Christianity, non, not in terms of geography, not in terms of numbers, and not in terms of content and history uh, either. I was on the high church side, you can, you can say, even in... Uh, that was not very, a very strong part of, of the town where I grew up, but I remember that I always enjoyed going to the Lutheran services with the sung uh, prayers and with the, the communion and things like that, rather than the more informal... Uh, prayer meetings. So yeah. from early age on, I I felt at home with liturgy. Um, but also for me, it was a strong uh, influence when I also began to discover Norwegian history. I, I liked history, I still do. Uh, and when we had history in school, uh, we also were taught about the Reformation. And that was presented in a neutral or even positive mm-hmm. way. But I kind of saw through that and got a very clear um, conviction that the Reformation was a disaster in the Norwegian history. Mm. We had been a Catholic country for longer than we had been a Protestant country. Christianity was was brought to Norway by the Catholic Church in the uh, Middle Ages, in the turn of the last century, uh, sorry, the, um, a millennium. Um, and we had become had been a part of the rich tradition of of the Catholic Church, uh, theologically, sacramentally, and also culturally. Mm. And that was removed from us by force, by armed force, by a Danish king and his coup. Uh, and I got the very increasingly, I, I had this feeling that that was a tragedy. And then the question began to arise, well, so what do I do with that? What, what can my choice then be? And eventually, uh, from all these different influences, I came to the, to the uh, conclusion that I had to at least learn more about the Catholic faith. So I began to read from the school library. I got some Catholics, Catholic pamphlets that was in the library there, written by a, 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 a Dutch Catholic priest who worked in Norway in the 1960s, who was a, um, an, an apologist, uh, who, who, who uh, uh, apologetic, who, who, who wrote pamphlets and and and, and books, and uh, I read some of those, um, and then I was convinced. So I approached the local Catholic uh, church, uh, which was 20 kilometers away in the nearby town Arendal, and the parish priest there, and he began to give me instruction. Now, Father, during this time that you were uh, come to the decision to become Catholic, uh, during that time, did you deal with some of the differences in theology and doctrine between your Lutheran upbringing and your new Catholic faith? Uh, certainly, that uh, that is uh, always a part of uh, of uh, becoming a Catholic. That's being stressed by the the, the, the priest or the one who gives instruction. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, that we make. Uh, so I was. Uh, being made aware of the differences so that I could make a, a choice in, on, a, on a good uh, uh, ground uh, or, or well informed, um, but there was uh, f- that that was not for me the uh, main uh, concern or main mm. focus. I didn't become a Catholic because of particularly this or that or had problems with this or that. For me, it was very much to actually find a solution to uh, mm-hmm. things like that, namely the question of tradition and the question of authority. Mm-hmm. I'd seen in my yeah. own hometown uh, how there were many differences, many uh, uh, disagreements between all these countless denominations, and they hadn't really a tool to solve it, because they were all there with each, had their own their Bible, and they read it, and then they couldn't solve Differences. So some baptized children, some didn't, and some uh, did this and some did that. Uh, um, there wasn't there wasn't much disagreement on uh, on ethical issues. At not mm. not at least then. Mm-hmm. Uh, perhaps more so now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, but I had discovered the church, uh, the church that had been there always, uh, which had a long history. Uh, who has, had been the, the uh, old church also in, uh, in Norway, 
uh, and f- who also had the continuity, uh, mm. and therefore, in my eyes, also had the authority. And I was very yeah. convinced by the by the. Um, it was important for me the authority of the bishops uh, mm. being successors of the of the apostles. The whole notion of apostolic succession, both regarding the teaching office and also regarding the celebration of the of the sacraments. So for me. Uh, there were no difficulties when there were things that were I was not used to that was uh, not had not been part of my uh, tradition, like the devotions to Our Lady, to uh, the, the practice of confession, and uh, the, the emphasis on Christ's presence uh, in the Blessed Sacrament. Yeah. Although that was not totally alien to me as a Lutheran, because. The, the, there are points there where they are close to our beliefs. Right. So, uh, so I had a sacramental view on communion b- before. Um, but for me, it was always um, th- this is not important in a sense. I, well, I would like to understand it. I would like to acquire it and begin to live this. But I'm not going to test it because if the church believes this, then I will do it also. I was going to say that that's the significance of the issue of authority. Yeah. We've got all these opinions out there. Well, how do Lutherans solve those differences of opinion? Well, as Catholic, we recognize the spirit-guided apostolic authority of our bishops. At what point did you discern a call to priesthood? Yeah, that is um, an interesting question. <laughs> Actually, um, it goes beyond my, my conversion. First time I, I remember I th- had that thought was in my, it was in my grandmother's funeral, uh, so my mother's mother, uh, and it was uh, a cousin of my mother, uh, that is a nephew of uh, the deceased, who did the service. So it was a, a distant relative of mine who was uh, a minister in the Church of Norway. Uh, and I remember in the midst of a child's uh, grief, uh, you know, in one's grandmother's uh, funeral, I also saw him and his ministry and his work and what he meant in this moment. Um, and that was the first time I discovered hmm. priesthood. But it was in the Lutheran context. <laughs> um, but I think that is the beginning. Hmm. So I could have... Well, looking back at it, no, no, I could couldn't have been. Uh, <laughs> it would something would have had to, to change. But but at least the vocation thoughts are early, uh, longer or older than my Catholicism, <laughs> uh, at least chronologically. Then, at the moment I became a Catholic, I was nineteen, uh, so it was during my last year of A level college studies. I went for instruction, and then at nineteen I was received into the church. I, had, I felt a calling to the priesthood straight away, but I didn't tell anyone, didn't tell the priests uh, there of the, of the parish, and no one else either, because I was convinced it was uh, this typical phenomenon we call the convert's disease. Mm. Yeah. So I thought uh, I would just really make a, a fool of myself, uh, saying, you know, this because everyone else have said these things as well, and then it turned out not to be, and so on. So I waited for four years. Uh, discussed it with um, after two years I mentioned the thought for uh, in a conversation with the, with the parish priest there in Arendal and a bit later I discussed it also with uh, uh, a priest in Bergen where I was uh, uh, first I was in the Navy do, doing my service there and then later in the, at the university and I began discussing this with Father Rolf Buvitz, uh, who I know also have been interviewed in this uh, uh, by you uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, at some yeah. point, uh, and I may, um, I'm began to discuss this uh, with him and clarified uh, my thoughts, and in the end made the decision to um, offer myself for the diocese of, of Oslo. That was four years after my right. uh, after I was received into the church. How did your family respond to all these changes in your life? Yes, uh, I had worried about that, uh, of course. Um, One cannot take for granted a support or an understanding, sadly not even if one's parents are Catholic, uh, I know. Um, But they responded with... uh, They responded wonderfully. Uh, uh, From the very beginning, it was respect. Uh, This is your life, this is your decision. You have to do what you believe is, is right. Um, so it was 
from the beginning, uh, respect and acceptance. Later on, uh, more understanding uh, also of the Catholic faith and more uh, in, uh, interest in it. And on my ordination day, uh, it was pride. So, uh, so uh, they, they um, have really grown uh, into it. Uh, and I know that they um, uh, follow me and my work and I, uh, with their keen interest. I know that they follow the, the news pages on the Catholic websites of, mm. of our diocese, the no yeah. because they always comment <laughs> to me what they have read there. So I know that they are, they are taking part oh, uh, in great. my life. So uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for that, and I know that um, it could have been much more difficult. Uh, well, it seems to me that the, 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 uh, the calling to be the pastor of the cathedral parish would carry with it uh, some expectations and demands that you probably never expected of yourself when you were just discerning the call of the priesthood, right? I would think that's a very special demand at the cathedral. Uh, yes, I suppose it, it is. Um, uh, are you like uh, Father Rolf with a huge diocese area that you have to cover uh, for uh, your parish? Uh, Oslo is uh, less of a geographical area than, than many of, of the other uh, parishes, but it's right. larger in numbers oh, okay. uh, and in many different nationalities, many different languages uh, being used. Uh, but there is also a number of, of priests serving these different language groups. Mm. So it's a huge uh, setup, uh, and I also have many good uh, co-workers, both priests and, and lay people. Uh, so I, I feel I have a, a great uh, support. Mm. I had been a priest for... Um, I'm a priest 10 years later okay. on this year, uh, okay. and I had been a priest for, for eight years when I came to, to the cathedral. Uh, so I had had time to grow into it. And there are demands uh, made uh, in every context and in every sure. setting, although they are different. And at the core, uh, it is the same. Uh, at the heart, it is the same mm -hmm. everywhere. It's celebrating Holy Mass. It's hearing confessions. It's um, trying to bring God to, to people and bring people to mm -hmm. God. And then there are various things that are, are different, like, uh, like the size of the church and the number of people working there and, uh, mm -hmm. and so on. But... Um, God's grace is also in it, so... Uh, yeah, uh, you depend on that. Yeah. yeah, and one is kept busy, so there is no time to, uh, to uh, get too worried either. You know, you're the third um, guest that I've talked to since coming here that's mentioned that the funerals had a big impact in your journey, whether it was actually opening a person to the faith or to the call to the uh, priesthood. And it, it made me think, I'm wondering whether... For many Norwegians, because for many Norwegians, their faith is not as active in their life, is the funeral becoming a major place to communicate the faith? Those that come, to, you know, to a Catholic funeral or to a Lutheran funeral, you know, dealing with the end of life, dealing with the long issues because of their catechesis isn't very mm. solid to deal with life and the end of life if, in fact, the funeral becomes a great place of evangelization here in Norway. Um... It, for the Catholic Church, it is certainly a, um, an occasion for many uh, non-Catholics to discover the Catholic faith mm -hmm. and the Catholic liturgy. Uh, but I think also that is the case with, with weddings or with, uh, yeah. with sure. uh, baptisms oh, sure. as well. Um, confirmation. And, and, uh, yeah, and, as, as, and confirmation, as well as the Holy Mass and, and, and liturgy in general, but these points that you have mentioned, and particularly funeral, is a place where lots of people would come who otherwise wouldn't have mm. come to the Catholic Church. And uh, certainly with the, with the funeral liturgy, the difference between the Lutheran s s funeral service and the Catholic Requiem Mass is quite striking, and that mm. makes an impact on people. The whole emphasis on what actually is, is being done, that this is... a, a Prayers and a mass offered for the uh, for the for the dead, um, um, doing something actively rather than just remembering. Um, so uh, a lot of people have commented that positively that mm -hmm. uh, this was something else that they have never uh, seen before, uh, a, a very different way yeah. of of, of uh, 
uh, they have a very different funeral uh, liturgy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, of, mm. I was saying one of the other guests had mentioned that the, after a Catholic funeral of a person who had been seeking the Catholic Church come into the church and then passed away early, mm. but most of his friends had been secular. And afterwards they said, you know, they'd never heard a funeral like the hope that was there mm. in the Catholic. They, essentially what they had always heard is, he was a good man and we'll miss him. Yep. In the Catholic Mass there was hope, there was a very positive view of life and death, and that was striking to them. Yeah, well, the, the pure fact that the, the theology allow you to pray for the dead mm -hmm. opens up some possibilities of what you can do with, uh, the, with the funeral liturgy. Now you mentioned a couple times in your, uh, your journey how important history was. Mm -hmm. And John Henry Cardinal Newman makes that statement in his essay on the development of doctrine, doctrine, to be deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. Would you agree with that in your own journey? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, that's really me. I mean, uh, <laughs> as I've ex explained earlier, f for me, um, uh, knowledge of, of history or search into history was very uh, important uh, on my journey to, to Catholicism. Mm -hmm. to, to, to discover that um, there was a Christianity between St. Paul and Martin Luther was, uh, <laughs> was um, uh, yeah, it was a new discovery that it wasn't just a, a vacuum or, a, or a, 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 an evil darkness or, or something like that, but it was a living church with um, uh, a rich tradition, a rich history, uh, with countless of generations of, uh, of good Christians, mm -hmm. also in our own uh, country. Mm -hmm. um, it's amazing when you go all over your country, some of these towns like Bergen or as you go up through the fjords, almost every little town will have a church that's long before the Reformation. Mm -hmm. And I've wondered how the Norwegians deal with those little memories of their Catholic background. Do they ignore them? Are they just a part of architecture? Mm. No, they don't ignore them. They're quite proud of their, of their mm. history. And uh, uh, I think that uh, the, the little tragedy here is that most Norwegians... And that uh, is really what happened during the Reformation as well, and it has lasted until now, that most Norwegians are not aware of uh, how dramatic their Reformation actually was. I mean, they mm. emphasized the continuity, and they still use these churches for their Lutheran services, and they feel that they are uh, in the line of their, of their ancestors, and of, of course, mm. in many ways, they, they are, uh, sure. you know, keeping up the, the faith and praying in the same places as... Uh, generations before them have have prayed, but just as the first Lutheran vicars that came from Denmark, they were instructed to be subtle and not uh, to be careful in how they sneakingly introduced uh, uh, Lutheranism, and I think that worked. So they they kind of think that it it is the it same as the their same. ancestors had. Uh, so 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 very self confident and and uh, confessionally. Uh, uh, Conscious uh, Lutheranism is an mm -hmm. elite phenomenon. I don't think that is really ordinary Norwegians. They they wouldn't really know exactly what it is to be a Lutheran. Uh, not anymore. Mm -hmm. They were instructed in school in generations before these uh, the Lutherans, uh, the Lutheran catechism, and also uh, learning or being taught negative things about uh, mm -hmm. Catholicism. So on one level, they knew that they were Lutherans and not. Catholics, but in their heart, I think still there hadn't been a Reformation, and um, and that is also the hope for the Catholic Church in Norway and our greatest challenge to kind of hit that part of their heart to say that we are actually not anything different than what had always been here, and your your predecessors, your your um, your ancestors, um, it was their their church and their faith and. It has returned, and uh, it's not something alien. It is uh, something that belongs also here. Country. Thank you, Father. I wonder if I could ask you for a blessing as we, uh, for the audience as we end our program. Certainly. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I ask God to bless and uh, keep and protect um, all who works for EW2TN and all who uh, watches uh, the program and ask God to strengthen us all in our witness that we are giving to the faith. And I ask God's blessing in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you very You're much. You're welcome. Appreciate your witness and your, 
and our prayers are with you and your ministry here. In, thank you very much. In Norway. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. We'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back. And now we bring yet another conversion story from our recent trip to Oslo, Norway, where we speak to former journalist, now priest, Father Rolf Bovitz from St. Svithin's Parish in Stavania. Thank you for joining us on the Journey Home program. We had a previous interview with a parishioner of yours, is that right? Yes. Professor uh, Cherholm. Yep. So you were actually involved with his own journey to the faith yourself, right? Yes. Uh, he... Um... I was in contact with him uh, several times on his, uh, in his capacity as a professor and my as a, as a parish priest. And uh, then one day he came to me and asked for instruction in order to, <laughs> to become a Catholic. We're here on this episode to talk about your own journey because like many on our, our interviews, you, I'm assuming you were a, a Norwegian Lutheran originally, is that correct? I was, that's correct. How about taking a couple steps back and giving a summary of your own spiritual journey? Well, I, uh, I was baptized uh, as a child, as a, a Christian. I, I grew up in a Christian home. Uh, we were not much practicing Protestants, um, except, of course, for Christmas, like everyone in Norway. Mm -hmm. And I think my parents were very happy that all three children, we were three children, we were all wanted to be confirmed in the mm -hmm. Lutheran Church. And um, I think uh, they lived and still live a very... A pious life as good Christians and with a high standard of morals, mm. uh, but they do not do much for practicing their faith, mm. uh, like we. Uh, but we are for traditions. So, so we we pray, we say grace before meal, uh, but only on Christmas Eve. Mm. So that's uh, that's our way of life, yeah. you could say. And I was uh, in this. Um, Lutheran Church of Norway, which is a state-run church, um, up to the age of, of 28. I, I tried to be a bit more interested in, uh, in the church when I was confirmed at the age of 15, but I, I never succeeded much in, in practicing. Mm. Um, then something happened, and that was when I was 22 years, my grandfather died. Mm. And... Um, in the funeral, the, uh, the minister said that he prayed for his grandchildren every night before falling to sleep. And we have never, had never learned to pray in the evening prayer like most children do in, in Norway. But my parents, I think they were too private about their mm -hmm. faith. Mm -hmm. So I was rather shocked to hear this, that my father prayed, that my grandfather prayed for his grandchildren. And I was about to be um, uh, an uncle because both my, my sister and my brother were expecting children at that time. And I thought, who is going to pray for them? Hmm. And those thoughts run through my head in the funeral of my grandfather. Hmm. And that's when I started to try to, re to reawake my Christian faith. We, we say in Norway that I still have the faith of my childhood, and I wondered if that's enough for a mature hmm. man. St. Paul says that when I was a child, I th spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I acted like a child, but now I'm a mature man. And that's my, my question to lots of, of uh, Norwegians who say they still have their faith of their childhood. They do not speak like children, and they do not act like children. They act like mature persons. Shouldn't they also mature mm -hmm. their faith? Mm -hmm. And this started the process for me. And I, I visited lots of churches, a variety of churches and um, other faith communities 
in the search of something. I was even twice in a in a in a Lutheran in the Catholic Church in uh, in Bergen. But then I moved to Oslo and I met uh, a colleague who was a Catholic, and I said, "I need you to take me to the Catholic Church," which he did, and I was so taken by the liturgy mm. and the. Um, the proclamation of God's word, the, the homilies, that I started going to church regularly. And I think that was the breakthrough of, mm. of my story. It's that I started going to church and I would miss the church if I once on a Sunday did not go to the church. Mm. You, you, in some ways you say it was actually the pulpit preaching in that Catholic church, right? Was that not happening in your Lutheran churches that you were visiting? Or? I felt that the proclamation of the word of the Lord and the way they proclaimed the Lord's word more than human word was speaking more to me. Mm. In the Lutheran church, I, I often found interesting stories what had happened to that priest on the way to the church or whatever. <laughs> and... and in itself, that could be interesting, but it wasn't. It wasn't God speaking to me in the same way. Mm-hmm. So I, I rather liked the way the the Dominican preached on the Sundays, and it was a Dominican church I mm-hmm. I went to, and I, I never understood that that was not a parish church really. Mm-hmm. So I just kept going to that Dominican church in the Dominican monastery here in Oslo. So you're starting to, at that point in your life, experience a spiritual awakening through a Catholic church, which is maybe a surprise for most Norwegian Lutherans, right? I think so, because when when I first got to know the people there, I thought, but they are thinking the way I am thinking. Mm. And I had lots of uh, prejudice, and I was biased to the Lutherans, that to the Catholics, that they believed in Mary and not in Christ, and all these things that we were brought up to think of kind of vulgar attitude towards the Catholic Church, and I, I experienced that the belief I had was practiced in the Catholic Church, plus something new about saints and Mary that was not central but still a part of the faith that I had no problems in adjusting to. And accepting, so so to get to know the Catholic Church was for me to learn about my own faith, really. So so my big step was not to convert, which I did after a year, but it was to start going to church and experiencing what you should have learned, or maybe way back when, but you're discovering it in the Catholic Church. Yeah, I I think so. Yeah. So it was about a year in your transition into the church. Yep. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I went to the church for a half year, and then I took some instruction. There was a course run by a Dominican father, Father Elletal, still alive, and he was a wonderful instructor and a wonderful example of a priest who, uh, who, 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 could, who could lay out the faith and who could do that in a convincing way because he lived the faith in his everyday life. Hmm. Yeah. And he still does. Yeah. Uh, in that training period, did you come uh, face-to-face with some of the theological differences between your Lutheranism and Catholicism? Was that an issue for you during that time? No, that was not a big issue for me. Okay. No. Uh, it's, um, I, I felt that the way Father Dahl explained the faith, things fell into places for me. Okay. So it, was, it, made, it, made me, it made me understand my own faith, and it made me accept the faith of the Catholic Church as a very natural thing. And I, I found no obstacles whatsoever um, because I think that the, the infallibility of the Pope, uh, it's no big thing really. The, the two or three times in the course of 2,000 years of history has the Pope used his infallibility to, de- to declare some, some dogmas. Mm. It's no big thing. He more respects that position uh, to make sure that as the bishops gather that they're hearing the Holy Spirit and being guiding. That's really what he more often does, really. And I think that the Holy Spirit 
is given to each and every one of us individually by our confirmation and by our baptism. But it is also given to the apostles when they were gathered together. So it is given to the church as a church. And I feel that God is bigger than the church, but the church is certainly bigger than I am. And that makes me feel that the, the, Luth, no, the Catholic Church is happy to have only one pope. While in the Lutheran Church, one might say that there are as many popes as there are Lutherans. Yeah. <laughs> in America, there are, I'm not sure how many, but there are a number of Lutheran denominations as a result of the multiple popes. Is that true over here too? Yes, and especially in my hometown, Stavanger, hmm. which is, even if I was born in Bergen, I was raised in Stavanger, and I'm now back in Stavanger as a parish priest, and there are... Uh, numerous, I, I can't say the number, of, ver of a variety of, of Lutheran sects and organizations. Mm -hmm. And I feel sometimes that they fight each other more than they fight paganism in our country. At what point did you discern a call to the priesthood? I mean, were you considering that as a Lutheran? Yeah, no, I never did because I was a journalist and I usually say I lived happily as a journalist and uh, had a good job, I had a good income, I had a nice apartment here in Oslo. I had an interesting job. Uh, I was um, reporting on Parliament for, uh, for a press agency and also for a um, magazine uh, issued by the Norwegian Employers uh, Confederation. So I was involved in, in, in politics and business um, things. Very interesting. And I'm, I'm still interested uh, in these things. And the priest that took me, that received me into the church, he said, I suppose you, as every convert, would like to be a nun or a priest or a monk. And I advise you not to talk to anybody about it for two years. And if you still are persistent, you can come to me and talk. So I went for two years longing for a more active role in the church, a more, a more active way of practicing my faith. And I tried in many ways to involve myself in things going on in the monastery church. But of course there wasn't much going on for lay people in that church. So after two years I told him I've been waiting for two years and I think it's time for me to do something about my life. I was at that stage, I was 31 years old, I was unmarried, and I was, uh, I started to be unsatisfied with, the, with my place in life. Career, yeah, okay. I, I felt something was missing. I wanted to be more active as, as a Catholic. I might have done that if I had known that there was a parish that I belonged to, but I was so taken by Dominicans and <laughs> so preoccupied with them that I, uh, and, and I, the more I thought about it and talked to my spiritual advisor, uh, the more I thought that maybe um, a monastic life is not my way of life. And he said, you're such an active person. I think you would do well as a, as a diocesan priest. And I didn't know what he meant. I thought a priest was a priest. <laughs> so the big shock came here in this room at London Cluster. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> And the bishop, late Bishop Gran, was celebrating the feast of the announcement, which is the day of dedication of this monastery. And after the mass, the sisters opened up, and we had a very nice church coffee here. And my uh, spiritual advisor, who was a priest, Dominican priest, who also was from Bergen, introduced me to Bishop Gran, who also was from Bergen, mm. and he told me, Monsignor, I told him, Monsignor, there is someone who would like to talk to you because he wants to become a Catholic priest. And I was totally unprepared. <laughs> he hadn't warned me that uh, he would do this, even though we had spoken about it, but not on this occasion. Yeah. So the bishop <laughs> said, okay, why don't you phone me on Tuesday and I we will make a, an appointment and you can come to my office. And I said, thank you. I didn't know what to say. Uh, usually I have no problems in talking, but <laughs> at that moment I was, I was taken aback. So I phoned him, and he invited me to his office, and he 
talked and I said, I really am looking for a community. I think I am a, maybe I should be a man of a order. I, I have lived alone for such a long time that I think that I would rather live in a community. But I have been advised by, by this spiritual advisor of mine to rather uh, join uh, the diocesan clergy. And Bishop Brown said he was, he was a man, he was a trappist. Mm. So he was a man of order himself. But he said, maybe you can start out as a diocesan priest. And should you choose, you could um, have my permission to enter into an order. Should, you, should that be your decision later on? And it's easier to go this way than the other way. Okay. <laughs> and I thought that was, as everything in the Catholic Church was very wisely put and very natural and seemed to me to be very fitting for my circumstances. So he had some deliberation with his consultants and advisors and he accepted me and I said I need another year to, to, to finalize some, some business, some, some loans and housing and, and to straighten out. And he said I would rather help you to straighten that out if you can begin this year which was another shock for me because I thought I could have time to prepare. I always need time to prepare, and I'm never given that on important stages in life. So I, um, I got my apartment hired out so that I could keep it in, and everything I did in the beginning was in case I will not finish the studies. And the bishop asked me, what languages do you know? Because we cannot have stud students in Norway. We have to go abroad. And I said I could, I could manage in, in English and in French. So if I could go to, for instance, Durham in England or, or, or London and then Institut Catholique in Paris, that would be very fitting. He wanted me to, to divide my studies so I got impressions from two different cultures. cultures. Yeah. yeah. And he said, yes, very good, he said. And then he sent me first to Germany and then to Italy. So, so much <laughs> for my wishes. And, uh, but I think it was more practical reasons why, why, why it ended up with, uh, with Germany, Frankfurt, with the Jesuits. So I had um, philosophy in Germany, in German, which is not easy for Germans. And it was even more difficult for me, but I managed <laughs> and then I went to Rome and took the, the theological studies with the Dominicans, not anymore with the Jesuits, and in English, not anymore in German. So I was very happy in Rome, I must mm. say. Mm. Um, it, was, it was quite another thing to start with theology when you had fought with, with German philosophy. And I also think that my my way of, of living, my faith of thinking, my, my, my way of, of... My spirituality is much more Dominican than it is Jesuit. And I've seen that afterwards also when it comes to spiritual direction, when it comes to, to retreats and ways of praying, I am much more in the Dominican direction. So in a way this... This room here is one of the places where I had my best experiences and my nicest and most intense experiences in the religious have been in the chapel here mm -hmm. with the sisters praying for me, with me and, and in my intentions. Mm -hmm. Not only for myself but also if there is something important I tell the sisters could you please pray and I do and I know that it works. Prayer works. And that's why I have been missing this community so much when I've been away. Yeah. But I feel that we also are united in prayer. And I have taken my experience from Lunden Kloster and from the Dominican Fathers to my present work in Stavanger. Uh, so we pray the divine office in the chapel. And since I don't have a community, I make a community with lay people coming, inviting them to join me. So we, we are a small community praying every day in the, in the chapel in, in the parish of, of St. Swithens in Stavanger. So what I have received here, I have tried to, 
take with me in the forms that I have been able to, to practice it. That's why I'm so grateful for this place. For this place, yeah. yeah. It's neat for us to be able to tape your story here in the midst yeah. of this. It, you mentioned before that uh, you were uh, sensing the call originally to uh, being in community and maybe a, a, di a Dominican priest yeah. and, and then you end up a diocesan parish priest. Tell the audience uh, your community as a diocesan parish priest is pretty big here, right? It is. Um, <laughs> in, uh, in size, yeah. it is uh, almost the size of the, Bel of the, of the country Belgium. For instance, so it's big. Your parish, my parish, <laughs> and I don't know how many dioceses there are in, in Belgium, but there are there are more than. Uh, and, and so it's it's big in size. It's not so big in persons um, because the Catholic Church in Norway is so small. Mm -hmm. But we have registered four and a half thousand people, uh, and we know that there probably are another twenty thousand poles only Popes, oh. and lots of other people who are not registered, so we don't know, we are not in contact with them, because they have to sign up when they come to the church. So one, par one church in this large parish area? Yes, one church. And then we have th two, three other places where we celebrate Mass once a week or once a month. Mm. Um, and we are now, and our parish church takes 240 people. So when there is mass in Polish, people are standing outside, they're kneeling on the door, on the steps to the, to the church door. And we have two masses in Polish every Sunday. Mm. And we have seven, eight, nine different languages um, being celebrated at least once a month. Do you do the masses in Polish or do you do them in Latin? Or what's your... No, I, I don't do masses, I, I celebrate masses. I'm sorry, of course. <laughs> uh, but I, I celebrate masses only... <laughs> In, in Norwegian and English and German and French and Italian. Uh, so, so I can cover the other languages. So we have a Polish, we have a Polish assistant priest just being uh, appointed. We have um, um, a Tamil priest visiting us once a month. We have a Vietnamese priest visiting us mm -hmm. once a month. And a Spanish-speaking priest coming mm -hmm. once a month. And then we have a Filipino priest celebrating Mass in Filipino once a month, living in the parish. But he is serving several other parishes. So he is, he is uh, traveling several hundred kilometers every week. Hmm. I mean, you're covering an area in your parish like many bishops cover in other countries. Yes, probably we do. I, uh, I remember when I was taking a seminar in Rome, there was an American uh, priest uh, having a seminar on parish work. It was very interesting. And, and he said, when you come to a parish as a parish priest, you should have some routines. For instance, you could start alphabetically and visiting people. And I have a friend, he said, he took an afternoon stroll. First day he was in the parish, and he, worked, he walked the border of his parish on that afternoon so that he could take it in possession virtually. And I said, yes, that was very nice. I could do that too, but I would need a boat and I would need three months to cover my air and the boundaries <laughs> of my parish. Uh, are you seeing an openness from the Lutherans in your parish to the Catholic faith? I do, very much so, especially from the officially, uh, official uh, Church of Norway. Mm -hmm. We have, uh, I was, I w we have a very nice um, um, relationship to, to the Lutheran bishop. I was invited to his ordination and also to the lunch af afterwards, mm -hmm. uh, together with the king. He was present, or he's always mm -hmm. present at the uh, ordination to bishops in his church. And then um, when we came out of the cathedral, he was there uh, greeting us, uh, everyone. And I introduced myself as the local Catholic parish priest. And he said, I need to talk to you. <laughs> and since then, we have had such an open relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think his way of behaving is, is the same, is, is, um, is also affecting all others, because he is so open to the Catholic Church. There is, it's unthinkable that we should have a question 
of can we use a Lutheran church? And they should say no. It's absolutely unthinkable. Mm. And 20 years ago, that will not be so mm. obvious. That will mm. not be so self... Um, mm. self... Uh, evident or... Yeah, it would yeah. not be something natural. Yeah. You, you, you would not know in advance what kind of answer you would get. Mm. Um, so, so, so in this way, there is an openness. Mm. Also... I am invited for, to, to, to preach, uh, to give uh, lectures and conferences in, in Lutheran uh, churches and parishes and organizations, so, and I do it gladly. And formerly they wanted to know what is the Catholic Church. Now they take a topic, How, what can we Christians do in order to mm. integrate uh, refugees and foreigners or... Uh, be together fighting paganism and modern a- atheism or whatever. But it's so much more, we, we feel so included now. Uh, and I think that's a big step forward. A word, probably yeah. a great result of John Paul's yeah. visit and witness to us. Uh, also, and, yeah. yes, uh, indeed. Father Bovitz, thank you very much thank for you. joining us on the journey home. Thank you for your witness yeah. and for your ministry here. We'll keep our prayers for your big work in your huge parish. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us on this special episode of The Journey Home. God bless. See you again soon.